Well, good morning, Church at the Red Door family. Hey, thank you for joining us here this morning. And uh, once again, if, if you've just joined us today and this is your first time, then a special welcome to you. It's a privilege to have everybody here today. I wanted to spend a minute, uh, you know, I'm sure many of us are kind of maybe getting a little weary or just wondering when are things going to be different. Well, I want to let you know that we continue to work on some ideas and ways in which to connect. So we haven't forgot about connecting, all right? But we have a couple things we're working on in terms of home groups and some other things that are gonna help us find ways to connect with each other and to connect with our Savior. So if you stand by for that, and there'll be some more information coming in a, in a week or two, all right? I just wanted to make sure I shared that with you. Today, by the way, is Communion Sunday. Pastor Paul is going to be leading us in communion immediately following the message today. So if you don't have the elements right now, communion elements, just take a few minutes to go get those so you're ready when that time comes. Now today, Pastor Jeff is continuing his message on the heart. And friends, this is a crucial message on the heart. Now it's a three-part series, so we're in the middle one today. So if you, did, if you weren't here last week, you can go to the archive and you can watch that. But these are really, really critical messages about our heart, watching over our heart, understanding our heart, and what we can do as we walk with God with a renewed heart, okay? So Jeff is going to continue that message today. And you know what it says in John chapter 7? It says, He who believes in me, out of his heart flow rivers of living water. Now, don't we all want that, friends? Don't we want those living waters to come out of us so we can share the gospel and bless others? I say, yes, we do. And so this is a really important message today and next week as well, friends. I also want to introduce to you today two people, Rick and Pam Carlson, who are going to be reading the scripture for Pastor Jeff this morning. Now, Rick and Pam have been with the church since day one, Church at the Red Door, since the very, very beginning. Rick is one of our trustees, and Rick and Pam sit on our uh, executive team as well. So um, stand by for them and welcome them when you see them. They'll be reading the scripture. Okay, I'm going to open our service now in prayer, and then we'll move on in to worship. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, good morning, Lord. What a privilege it is to be here today just to worship you, to gather, Lord. Wow. We're just so thankful, Father, the way in which you... Uh, open our hearts and to bless our hearts, Lord, Father, this morning. Guide us, Lord Jesus, to hear your word this morning. And thank you, Father, for Pastor Jeff. Would you just please anoint him this morning and that your message, Father, would go forth and uh, touch the hearts. We're so thankful, Father, for that. Lord, uh, just I pray for all of those that are here with us today. Uh, I thank you for blessing them, watching over them, guarding their going down, their coming in. Thank you for caring for us and for caring for Church at the Red Door. And we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. All right, please join me as we move into worship. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Randy. Appreciate that introduction, my friend. And uh, hey, good morning, Church at the Red Door family. Uh, it's so good to be back with you. We're going to continue our uh, little mini-series on the heart on the heart. If you remember last week, if you were with us, a uh, lot's been read, a lot, excuse me, a lot's been sung, a lot's been written about the human heart. Uh, as, as we've said before, uh, the world is clamoring to say, trust your heart, to, to be, uh, uh, the heart is the, uh, you got to trust your intuition. Your, your heart is good. It, it just, if we could just get back to that original light that is within all of us, uh, that's the mantra, and that's really the foundations for actually many world religions. If we can just get and cut away that excess and get down to the core center of who we are, we're going to find something very good. The Bible, on the other hand, as we looked at last week, has a very different story, which is why the gospel is offensive. The gospel is not just that Jesus died. That's the epicenter of the gospel. But the total message is we start at a great deficit. So we looked in Jeremiah 17 last week. The heart is sick. Who can know it? We just can't. It's deceitful. It's deceptive. It's who can know? Well, God knows it. 
and through the word as we begin to integrate what he says about who we are and we acknowledge him in all of our ways, then what happens? We begin to say, well, you know what? Of course that's true. Of course it's in, in fact, it's just so apparent that I was, I was the problem all along. It's so apparent that uh, a lot of the things that happened in my life, yeah, I've been victimized at various points, but I've also been the victimizer at various points. And so I think we would all have to, in the end, once we've had the washing of the water with the word, just acquiesce with God and say, you know what, I was part of the problem. So what I want to start with this morning is I want to look at the ways in which the world comes down on the heart. What do they say? We looked at last week and said it's all basically good. We can just, we can reprogram it a little bit. We can maybe get a community that will help. We can get all kinds of resources. Maybe we even use medication. We do all kinds of things and, uh, and that's going to solve our heart issue. Well, the Bible clearly says that there's only one way to solve it, and that is, as we'll see this morning, a whole new heart, a brand spanking new heart. So if you go back to the garden right after the fall, what was the reaction of Adam and Eve? Well, they covered themselves in leaves. They were hiding from their deficit. They knew they had sinned. They recognized their own nakedness. They were naked and unashamed, the Bible says, until they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then all of a sudden they could see themselves for what they were and they felt shame. So rather than just acknowledging the shame and then going back to God and trying to, you know, either make restitution at that point or do whatever they could do to reestablish their relationship, they ran for the hills. And in doing so, they cover themselves up in leaves. And then, of course, God comes along and kills some animals and covers them in these bloody skins. This was the very first place in Scripture we get of an advanced picture, uh, the Proto-Evangelion, where we get a picture of uh, God coming in, and it's a foretaste of the cross that would come thousands of years later. And these are important things to see, and these are important things to understand. So as we go along here, uh, we can see that, well, what are our current leaves that we use today to try to cover ourselves? Can I just say the number one leaf covering mechanism that we use today are the leaves of science. Now, let me say in advance, many of you know, I love science. I love it for what it is capable of telling us. And I also acknowledge what it is not capable of telling us. And there is a battle raging right now, culturally, whether you are aware of it or not. Science is trying to finally put to bed the idea of a soul, of a heart, of a center of man altogether. Whether you know that or not, it's true. There's two ways, functionally, that the world uh, tries to deal with heart issues. Okay, so there's two ways. And by the way, there is no way to lead a purely scientific life. People say, well, I just work off the data. No, you don't. There's no way you do that. As I was in Montana a couple weeks ago, and I, and I was talking to them a little bit about this, you, there's no way for you to lead a perfectly scientific life. Somebody asks you, you're walking down the street, hey, how are you doing today? Say, well, I'm doing well. You're a scientist. You say, well, I'm doing well. You say, well, how can you say that? Well, I feel pretty good. I, I'm having a reasonably good day. You could challenge that scientist and say, you don't live a scientific life. There, you, that is not backed up with all the data. Let's take all of your vitals. Let's, let's do an exploratory search on how you're actually physically doing. We'll put all kinds of monitors on you, and we may come up with some very different data today. You're not doing well at all. Now, you would say, well, that's pretty ridiculous. Well, it's not. We, we work off intuition. We work off understanding. Uh, we work off things that ha science has no uh, ability to be even be able to discern, not the least of which is your own consciousness. So there's a battle raging right now in science trying again, let me say it again, to put to bed the notion in their minds, the notion of a soul, of an immaterial part, a self, if you will. So two ways, I believe, that the world tries to deal with what is a heart deficit. Well, let's just say we don't have a heart. Let's say we don't have it. 
Well, we know we have a physical heart. We can measure that. We can measure the volume of blood that it pumps through. We can, we can do all those things. But there's no real center of who you are. So number one, the world says, well, it's just mechanistically evolved. It's just an organ. And our consciousness is simply an evolved byproduct. There's no you. You're just a brain, an evolved byproduct of our physical brain. That's number one. Or maybe we don't say that. Maybe we don't go that far. But we say we have the ability to change our behavior. We, we can do radical self-surgery. And we can bring some partners along with that. We can, uh, we can do communes. We can live together in loving society. We can, and I'm, I'm going to give you two examples of both of these. Number one, what about the mechanistically derived evolution of our brain and that you're not anything more than just a brain? There is no self. There's no center. There's no soul. There's no immaterial part of you. Sorry. So science is trying to argue away the existence of a heart, not a physical heart, the existence of a center of you, a self, if you will, altogether. I was reading this this last few weeks, The Physical Evolution of Consciousness by a guy named Ralph Lewis. Listen to what he says. Now, this is science. This is, I would call these the leaves of science. This is us trying to cover what we all know to be intuitively true, that we have a bent towards evil. Listen to what Ralph Lewis says. <clears throat> Do you think of yourself as having a brain or being a brain? Now think about that. Can you conceive of your mind, uh, your personality, your self as entirely and only the product of a physical brain? I'm going to tell you, this is... Whether you're aware of it or not, this is a huge battle right now. The battle of consciousness, the battle of the self versus are you just a brain? He goes on to say the mind seems non-physical. Well, the reason the mind seems non-physical because the self is non-physical. It's the very essence of what we know to be true. The triune God himself is in flesh. God is spirit. And then there's the Holy Spirit. So the very foundations of the Godhead are immaterial and material representation of the Godhead. It says the mind seems non-physical, ethereal, and spiritual. The intuitive sense that the mind and brain are separate entities can be hard to shake, but he's going to ask you to shake them. Catch this. He says, but what we know from science is that the mind comes from the brain and nothing but the brain, the physical organ that I can extract from my cranium right now and put out on a table and chop up and dice up and say, that's all you are. You are a brain. You are not a self, an entity, a spiritual entity. You, there's nothing there. You are a brain. And listen to what he says. The mind is what the brain does. Any theory that does not begin with this assumption would necessarily imply that practically all the rest of modern science is fundamentally incorrect. And I think that is absurd. I think that is the biggest, one of the larger overreaches I've read from science. And I read a lot of overreaches from science that delve into the theological, the metaphysical, and say there is nothing out there other than the material universe. They have no proof of that. That statement in and of itself. And by the way, why would I be concerned if he is just a brain and I'm just a brain, what another brain says, postulates about reality. He's not a self. He can't, this, this idea, this concept, this construct, how can a physical non-entity, just a brain, a piece of flesh and blood and synapses and everything else, how can that determine and give guidance to other brains? Well, that alone, you've, you've discounted yourself in many ways. Now, his argument is simply this, and I think this is important. Many of you right now, Maybe you are yourself suffering from early stages of Alzheimer's or dementia. I know that that happens a lot, especially uh, we're in Palm Springs. A lot of people come here in their retirement years and some things begin to encroach on them. And then science says, see, their, their personality changes as a function of their brain. So they are just a brain. There's no spiritual core. Listen to what he goes on to say. If you've ever had someone close to you suffer from gradually progressive dementia, serious head injury possibly, or a variety of other forms of brain damage, or serious mental disorder, then you've witnessed the disruption of a kind of disassembly of the mind and of a 
of the person or personality you once knew. Such a change highlights how the mind is entirely a product of the physical brain and is dependent on intact neural circuitry. Well, no, it doesn't prove anything. And I've used this example before. Maybe you've heard me say it. I remember having this conversation recently with Marilyn Meberg, who we all love at Church of the Red Door, and, and her background and, uh, and her psychology and, and her understanding of the mind. And she liked this. So because Marilyn says this is okay, I'll use it again. Uh, let me just say this. I, I've, I've just kind of thought of it in terms of hardware and software. The software can be perfectly intact. But if you apply the software and plug it into some hardware that has been damaged in some way or is not functional, the software will then have the appearance working through the hardware not to be able to function properly. Now, I've got to tell you, that doesn't mean there's a problem with the software. It can be a function of the hardware. And I believe that's exactly what happens with dementia. Maybe you've got a partner or you yourself are suffering, a close friend or suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. I can tell you that the soul of that person, and especially in Christ, the spirit of that person, the immaterial part of that person, can be perfectly intact. And yet, the neural circuitry, as he says, as this doctor says, can be flawed. That's not an indication that we're only a brain. It's actually supporting evidence, in my view, that there is a, an immaterial part of us and a material part of us. When the material part to, starts to fail, the immaterial will have the appearance of not being uh, together, intact. It'll be disassembled, but only the appearance. And I think you can see that in various places. You see people that were in a coma. Their, their hardware was not functioning at all. They were in a coma, maybe just completely. And then people come out of a coma and they say they were conscious through, conscious through the pro process. That means their software was intact, their hardware, they regained their hardware, got fixed in some way, and, and then their software began to operate properly again. So again, I think this is support for the, both the material and the immaterial part of you. Now the reason we bring this up is because the leaves of science trying to cover the fact that our heart is deceptively wicked, who can know it, that very core we can argue away, we can, in fact, we can argue away an entire necessity of a moral universe. Well, if we just tell each other we're just a brain. I mean, you talk about, I mean, say, the very core of that, completely eliminates the arts and beauty and everything else. I had to go and have some, I've got to have some dental work. Yeah, I've got to have some dental work coming up here this next uh, few weeks. And I found out that I had broken two crowns. All right, just the greatest information that you ever get is that you've broken uh, two crowns or you need two crowns. And so, but I was sitting in the chair and I was looking and they, they have this, they have these pictures, these artistic, beautiful pictures taking you to very places like these drone pictures. And, and, and here I am in this dental chair about to get this horrible financial news and I've got to go back in, I don't know how many, and they can't get me in for the next three weeks and I'm about to get a lot of bad news. So they want to quiet my soul. So here they are and I, I am, it's this slow drone of going across the ocean and in the, in, the, in the distance you can see these kind of Caribbean looking mountains, very green and waterfalls and all this beauty and you're slowly traveling across the ocean as you're coming close to this. Now, my soul, my inner me, my heart is being, you know, I'm feeling, it's giving me joyous feelings. Now, purely from a scientific perspective, uh, I guess if it was survival of the fittest, well, there's sharks in that water, and what if we're going to crash into the mountain here, and could I get, you know, could I, I mean, you could think, could I drown in this ocean out here? I mean, that could elicit all those kinds of things, but it doesn't. There's a part of me, uh, the immaterial part of me, that can love beauty and nuance and, 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 and art and all these different kinds of things, and, and art and love and romance and all the beautiful things that God's given us. Well, no, you're just a brain. Well, no, I reject that. I'm sorry, Ralph Lewis. I reject your whole premise and you're delving into something that can is not possibly provable. You're eliminating the immaterial heart, the center of man, just because you've been able to figure out some neural circuitry. Yeah, you can figure out the material, 
but the driving point behind it. So that's not that's one way that the world chooses to try to deal with, hide from the reality that we have a fallen heart. The second way, as I alluded to earlier, is a, well, we can rewire this. We can, through this, uh, a lot of the psychological advances that we've made, uh, we can just basically do radical surgery. And I, look, I'm not disparaging all psychoanalysis or certainly biblical counseling at its core is I think the very best thing we can possibly do. There's rewiring even in discipleship that works. And I, and I love that and I appreciate that. But independent of God, it is a futile attempt. I was, uh, this last week, I was out of town and, uh, and I looked and I, I saw something. I was in a hotel and I was just kind of flipping through at night, the news and this and that. And I came across something called, it's, it's this new thing on HBO called The Vow. And some of you may have heard of this. It was, I think they call themselves Nexium. It was a guy by a, 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 a by the name of Keith Raniere, who was a, off the charts, you know, brilliant, brilliant guy. And uh, he started this kind of this. It's called, they called it ESP, and uh, and and they would work through, go back into your old memories, and not just deal with them, but eliminate them. And they had this whole kind of psycho. Uh, analysis that they did and they would rework the way that and, and take you out of the trauma so that you could live this beautiful ethical life and they created these communes and they were they were in South America they were all over the United States East Coast West Coast which is typically the case for these kinds of things and in New York they were really centered and then eventually uh, they, they called themselves ethicists and they were going to create recreate the world and let me tell you something there were billionaires that bought into this whole new thing. They were able to correct, help people with their Tourette's and all these different kinds of things. But as always is the case, it looks utopian. We finally, we finally unlocked the key to becoming joyful, beautiful human beings that love ourselves and love others. And in the end, it turned into, as almost always these things do, a sex cult, and, and most of the people that found out about this, they said, well, it's just a, the Nexium, it's a sex cult. There was so much more, and I haven't watched it, it's just the very first episode aired, and then I read some about it. But again, it's, this, it's, this, it's these leaves of science that says, no, we, we don't, we're, not, we're not at a deficit, we don't have a heart problem here. We can, we can just therapeutically work through this and become the lovely creatures that we all know intuitively that we are. And it, again, devolves into, and I think everything along the way, it, at the end, it again exposes, it exposes the human heart. So what do we do? What does the Bible say about all of this, all of our efforts, all of our righteous activity? whether it be a mechanistic understanding of the brain, whether it be in covering in that, covering the science leaves, of, or, or reevaluation and trying to get work through all these uh, mental problems that we were burdened with, and if we can just be free, then the true selves can come out. Well, that's one of the most tragic things that ever happens in human history, if you study human history at all, is that when the true self does come out, it doesn't get better, it gets worse time and time and time again. Again, I'm never suggesting that human beings created in the image of God are not capable of doing good things, but generally speaking, it's just, it's a mess. Now, let's go back 700 years before the time of Jesus and let's look at Isaiah chapter 64. And I'm going to read this for you. And it says simply this, for all of us, now this is specifically talking about Israel, but it really is all of us, as we'll see, have become one like one who is unclean. Okay, now again, we'll see over and over the purpose for Israel in their history, over and over, is that they give us an insight, a glimpse into what really is in our hearts. Israel, Israel's experience and their dealings with God gives us insight about ourselves how God dealt with Israel in the physical realm, and that's why they had so many of these just amazing encounters with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and these battles and everything. That was a template for us. We've talked about this over and over. 
The story of Israel is the story of every human being. They were thrown out of the garden, right? Into Babylon. They were in the stony waste places. And this is what God says about Israel. He says, in all our righteous deeds, everything that we do, all these leaves, all this cover up, all the things that we do, are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf. Those are, that is a strong statement. It says, in our iniquities, like the wind, they take us away. Into what? Into stony waste places. That's where they do. There is no one who calls on your name. Notice that. No one. Uh, the New Testament picks up the same refrain in Romans 3. There's no one. He, he uses this very language. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. That's why, by the way, we can have a, a community that is grace-filled and loves one another even when they sin against us because we're cognizant of the fact that we're part of the problem too. It's not always the other person and we're the victim. As I said last week, we are the problem. Jesus is the solution. It says, one who arouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us. You've delivered us into the power of our own wicked heart or iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. Is there really a potter? We'll talk about that in weeks to come. Is there really a potter? Is this, is, was there an end in mind or was this just blind evolution through the process? Now, again, I'm not arguing evolution or not evolution. What I'm arguing is blind evolution. Or was there creative intent? Was there a God-driven design behind this human life that I am and you are? The Bible says that he's the potter and we're the clay. All of us are the work of your hand. Uh, don't be angry beyond measure, O Lord. Uh, don't remember our iniquity forever. Behold, look now. All of us are your people and your holy cities have become a wilderness. Why? Because of our hearts. We have a heart thing. All of, our, all of our righteous deeds, they're like filthy rags in your sight. Even our good stuff, our covering, our philanthropy, everything, it's like rags in your sight because we still have a heart problem. It's become like a wilderness. Jerusalem is like a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire. All of our precious things have become a ruin. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O oh Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? It's a cry. You, God says your, your righteous deeds are so far from me. Your heart is set so it's on such a trajectory. You're a million miles away from me. And then the plea here is it's all desolate. It's all a wilderness. Will you help us? And the answer in Jesus is God saying, yes, I have a way for you. I'm gonna ask you a question. Why do you think Jesus spent so much time confronting the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees? Did he love the Pharisees? Did he love the religious leaders of his time? Of course he did, but he had to confront them. Why? Because he knew that they functionally had a heart problem, an inside, an immaterial, a center of them problem. They were getting the outside cleaned up, but the inside was a mess. The problem is they didn't know it. They assumed that because of some of their external activities, as Isaiah would say, their external activities somehow released them from the reality of a heart that was bent on evil. We do the same thing. We, we add up, well, I did this and I gave this amount or I, I served or I went and fed the poor this day or I'm nice to this person or I have a good marriage or whatever. We count these things up and say, therefore, I have a good heart. We, we try to cover all that up and gee, they just didn't realize at the center of them, they were absolutely at a deficit in their heart. And so Jesus had to expose them. Listen to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 3, it's 23, verses 1 through 12. Now, what I'd like to do here is I'd like to have some of our precious family from Chicago, Chicago, uh, Pam and Rick Carlson, would you mind reading Matthew 23, 1 through 12, and we'll get some insight here as to Jesus as he exposes their own hearts. He loved them, but he wanted to expose them. 
Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, Red Door family. I'm Pam Carlson, and this is my husband, Rick. Good morning, church. It's such a privilege to read the scripture today from our hometown of Chicago, Illinois. Our city has been in the news quite a bit this summer, and not for anything that's particularly good, unfortunately. But you can rest assured that God is still on the move here. He's still in control, and that is a very good thing. We know he's saving lives for eternity right here, even as the chaos in the streets is continuing. Nothing is happening that he does not allow and use for his eternal glory and purposes. And we are both taking great comfort in that eternal truth. So here's our scripture for today. Scripture is Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats at the, in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Back to you, Pastor Jeff. Thank you, Carlsons. It's uh, great to see your face. Uh, we so appreciate you. Uh, the work that both of you have done behind the scenes for, uh, I, I can't even begin to let you know, we are... We are so indebted to this couple. They have worked tirelessly for this for this community, uh, not only to see it birthed, but now to see it sustained for uh, almost four years. It's amazing what's happened here at Church of the Red Door. Thank you, Carlson. Uh, one of the things I think we know and can understand is that the natural state of our hearts is one of self-reliance. The Pharisees were self-reliant. They, they saw themselves as being uh, the good people. We are the good people and then there are the bad people. They could not see their own insides. Our views about reality, folks, they're just skewed. Then we come and we read Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceptively wicked, deceitfully wicked, deceptively wicked. Who can know it? And we say, what's all the fuss about? I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm a good guy. I'm not a mass murderer. I'm not a... And you fill in the blank for what you think, right? So... Well, what is that? Why all the fuss about all this? Well, we're going to uh, take a little deeper dive, and, and I, I want to I say this. Now comes the hopeful part. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a taste uh, in these last 10 minutes. I'm going to give you just a little bit of taste of what God had begun to tell Israel. Remember, Israel's story is our story. Israel's given the law. They failed. Uh, they they tried to do it on their own. The, the Pharisees, even in Jesus' time, they were trying to do it on their own. They were trying to cover with leaves. They were trying to make the outside clean when the inside was still a mess. Uh, they became religious and dogmatic and legalistic and all those things. We have those same tendencies. Whether or not we do it under the auspices of religion or Christianity or otherwise, we have the same deficit. God knew that there had to be a different deal. He knew we would not be able to keep the law. He knew there had to be a new deal. Now we've, we've referred to Jeremiah 31 over and over, but in the context of our study of the human heart, I think it's important that we really get into this. So I'm going to take you to Jeremiah 31. We're going to look at verses 31 through 34. It says, behold, now catch this, the, I'm just telling you that this new birth, this is a picture of the new birth. It's going to change everything. This is going to be, it's like Jesus said, many righteous men desired to see what you see, talking to his disciples, and they couldn't see it. 
They could get glimpses of it. This is a whole new construct in how God's going to deal with our heart. He gave us the law to expose us, not so that we could follow it. I'm going to make that point again soon. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, days are coming. Not yet. This is about close to a little over 600 years before Jesus would come. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new deal. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, which was the law, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, just like all of us are guilty of, Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. This is heart surgery. And I will be their God and they will be my people and they won't teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord because they're going to all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. That's the question. Remember the plea of Isaiah who lived just prior to Jeremiah's real crux of his ministry? They, uh, do you remember that? Uh, Lord, forgive us our iniquities. And now God through Jeremiah is saying, I will forgive your iniquities and I won't remember your sin anymore. This is going to be a whole new deal. A whole new way that I deal with humanity. But you have to admit that your heart is wicked and fallen and a million miles away from me. Now, Ezekiel is going to come along after Jeremiah during their Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah kind of saw the declination of their uh, captivity. But then Ezekiel is even going to give more specificity to this. And again, I know we touch on these all the time, but these are the most power, some of the most powerful prophetic views of Jesus in advance of his coming by hundreds of years that we get in all of scripture. Ezekiel sees it even more specifically. Now, why did he need, why did they need this? Because if you'll go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, we have the Shema. Jews to this day gather all the time in synagogues around the world and they quote and read together in unison the Shema. The Shema simply says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all of your heart and with your soul and with your might. That's their call. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And if you will, if you'll live under my commandments, then you'll have great prosperity and you won't live in these stony waste places. But the problem is they couldn't, and their history couldn't, and their history is our history. We can't either. You can try as hard as you want, but you'll find yourself in the same place as Israel, in desolate places. You're trying to be good, independent of acknowledging God and trusting Him and trusting Jesus and the new birth and the Holy Spirit living in you to transform you from the inside out as opposed to the outside in. They couldn't do it. And so here comes, now that, you remember, this is about 1,500 years before Jesus. Hear, O Israel, the Shema through Moses. Well, here we go. We'll go almost 1,000 years into the future during Ezekiel and uh, God saying, look, I know you can't love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I know you failed. In fact, as we'll see in the future, he predicted that they would fail. He knew their state he knew their fallen state. He knew they couldn't do it. So here's what he says to Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations, which you went, just like we do. We, I, profane, I profaned every place I went with my heart. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which you have profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. And here's, here's how I'm going to do it. How does God prove himself holy among the nations? I'm going to take you from the nations. I'm going to gather you from the lands and bring you into your own land. I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and you're going to be clean. That's the word, the washing of the water with the word. 
I'm going to cleanse you from your filthiness and from all of your idols, the worthlessness that your heart chases after. Moreover, now catch this, I will give you a new heart. I'm not just going to reform your neural circuitry. I'm not just going to put you into a community that's going to help you be an ethicist or a, a love person, you know, back to the 60s where you're going to put daisies in the rifle barrels. I'm not just going to do that. I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to put a new spirit within you and I'm going to remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from your uncleanness, which is where our deceitful hearts lead us. I will call for the grain, multiply it, and I won't bring famine on you. No desolate, stony waste places. And again, this is a spiritual analog and a physical reality for modern day Israel. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. And you will remember your evil ways and they weren't good. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. In other words, you'll finally see your heart for what it was. This is what God is speaking through Ezekiel. I'm not going to do this for your sake. No, uh, declares the Lord. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. And then lastly, the last few verses, thus says God, on that day I will cleanse you from your iniquities. I will cause the cities to be inhabited, the waste places to be rebuilt. Do you see the picture here? Whether or not you accept, the, uh, I believe it to be absolutely true, God's doing that in the nation of Israel started in 1948 and he's bringing and putting a new heart, a new spirit, our involvement therefore in Israel College of the Bible and other places that are promoting the gospel. I think it's the most powerful promotional gospel among the Jews in the history in the last 2,000 years. But either way, they're being moved from stony waste places and wilderness and desolation into fruitful places. He says the desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of who everyone passes by. And they will say the desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left around you will know that I have rebuilt the places and planted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will do it. God says he's going to do it. He's doing it. I think he's doing it in our own lifetime. Not only among the nation of Israel, but as a template for us. So what's the progress here? Well, they had to be first become ashamed. I mean, we don't like to hear that. We, we don't want to bring shame on anybody. Can I just tell you? The Bible wants us to be ashamed. It wants us to recognize the reality of our own hearts. And when we finally recognize it, acknowledge it, and then give ourselves to the new birth. It's clearly a picture of Jesus. I'm going to give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Read the book of Acts. I mean, it's just God doing exactly that. Give him a new heart and put a new spirit within him. That was Acts chapter 2. Be baptized for, for the forgiveness of sins. And I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. It's a, new, it's a spirit. I'm going to put my spirit in you. So first, there's, there's, a, there's a process of being ashamed of acknowledging our own iniquity. And then obviously the great news. I'm going to put a new heart in you and give you a new spirit. Now, I, again, as I said last week, folks, this is the gospel. The, 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 the whole message of Jesus is, is giving us insight. His life, the miracles that he did are part of the gospel. The whole, that's what we call them the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels. The whole story of Jesus. Why? Because he's proving that he's the king. He's proving that he has control over all of the material realm through miracles and everything else. The good news is that God is the boss of everything and that through him, you can get a new heart. You can get a new heart. So we're going to, next week we're going to, or, or in in following weeks, we're going to get a little, we're going to conclude this series on the heart. And I'm going to give you some a real insight into, well, what can we do? Well, I can tell you what, you can do something today, right now, before we go to communion. You can just acknowledge and say, look, I am ashamed of what's going on in my heart. Even if you've already had the born again experience, this is the process of a lifestyle of repentance. 
I still see my bent towards unfaithfulness. We'll explain that to you in weeks to come with the two natures. And you say, Lord, I, I want my heart to be in alignment with you. I want to acknowledge you in all my ways. I want to trust you. I want the center, the very center of who I am to be reflective of your glory and focused on you. My ambition is to be pleasing to you, as Paul said. If it's not, and you've gotten sidetracked and you, you're not very fruitful and you find yourself in desolate places, let's just pray. Let's just finish this and pray. And then I'm going to turn it over to Paul for communion. Lord, maybe someone is out there and they've never even understood these things. They don't have a new heart and they don't have the Holy Spirit. That can happen today. We can we can see them come to you and you will pour out your spirit on them and then they'll get water baptized and it'll be a beautiful picture of restoration, everything the prophets had seen in advance of Jesus. But there are some among us maybe this morning and myself included, that Lord, we need a lifestyle of repentance. We've seen how we've wandered. We've seen how our heart is bent on things that are not producing spiritual reality fruit that lasts so just tell the Lord right now. I'll just be quiet for a second. Just say, Lord, this, this area, you've, you put your finger on it. And I, I don't want to be following this path. Would you forgive me? Just tell him. Just tell him. So Lord, would you, would you help me? Would you, would you come and, and refurbish First, give me a new heart, and then now let me live into that new heart. Let me be spirit-led. Let my new heart be led by this new spirit in me. I want to live for you. So anyway, we will conclude this in weeks to come. Uh, I love you, and now I'll turn it over to communion with Paul. Thank you so much. Hello there, CRD family uh, and friends. Welcome to the communion table. Hard to believe, right? September. <laughs> We're in September now, but uh, thank the Lord for uh, our technology and for the great team that we have here at the Church of the Red Door that we can go ahead and through the internet still be able to partake in communion together as a family. Can I encourage you, if you haven't yet gotten your elements, can I encourage you to do that right now? Just take a moment, get up from the couch or wherever you're sitting, go ahead and just grab it. You can use water, you know, a cracker, some piece of bread, whatever. It'd be a wonderful time as a family to take communion together, to remember the tremendous sacrifice and the love that God has for each and every one of us. So go ahead and do that. And while you're doing that, let me just kind of share with you, I was led to Ecclesiastes chapter three this week. And many of you know it, you've even heard it in songs. It's called, There is a Time for Everything. You know, and boy, that couldn't be any more prevalent than right now as we watch our world struggle on so many fronts. It's kind of comforting to know that, as Solomon said, there's really nothing new under the sun. I mean, he shared this thousands of years ago. Let me read it to you. He says, you know, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to tear down and a time to build. He goes, there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. <laughs> We're kind of doing that right now. And a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time for a tear, and then there's a time to mend. Time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. You know, Solomon had this desperate search for the meaning and significance in life. And when it all boiled down to at the very end, it was boiled down to one thing and that was God himself. One thing remained, as Solomon said, it's God's presence. It's God's ever present hand in our lives, no matter what's going on. Even with injustice, even with the uncertainty and the threats that we seem to be finding ourselves with recently, you know, we can trust him and we can follow him. And because of his love for us, he sent his one and only son, so that we would, all of us that call upon his name would have victory over death through Jesus Christ. We would also have victory over the world because of our faith. You see, the Lord protects us and takes care of us, even in the presence of death 
or in the chaotic world that we can find ourselves in. He provides protection, refreshment, healing for all of us because of that tremendous sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you and for me, anyone who calls upon his name. So before we partake in this wonderful remembrance, let us reflect what the Apostle Paul told us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is what he said. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and then drink of the cup. Let's just take a moment, all right, and let's just reflect. Is there anything that we need to take to the Lord to ask him for forgiveness? Maybe something that happened during this week, maybe just this morning, you know. So let's just take a moment, reflect. If there's anything we need to take to the Lord to clean our hearts and to repent from, let's do it right now. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, Jesus, in the night in which he was portrayed, he took bread. He held it up, thanked his father for it. He broke it. And he goes, this is my body, which is going to be broken for you and for me. Do this always in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup, it's the new covenant, and it's in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and you drink the club, cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, Lord, we just... Uh, we come to you and we thank you for the tremendous sacrifice of your son, Jesus. The love that you showed to each and every one of us here. We're here today for the remembrance and to celebrate the unbelievable forgiveness and gift that you've given to each and every one of us. So, Father, I ask you to be with every family, with listening to this time that we are together, Father. May your blessing and protections continue to fall upon those families. And I ask you this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... That's right. Amen. God bless you.